Good morning. Pastor Mark here, uh, Oakdale Free Methodist Church here in Breathitt County, Kentucky. Glad to have you here with me today. This is the 23rd of September, uh, 2021, and guess what? Look what I'm wearing. I got my jacket on. First time in months. You know, I, I'm kind of, like I said yesterday, I'm kind of weird with weather. I like it when it gets cool like this. I like jacket weather. I'm not real crazy about, you know, freezing, you know, I like it. I like t-shirt warm weather too, but you know what? There's something really special about the fall season in there. I just, I love being able just to, to wear a jacket and just, it just feels good. It feels comfortable and, and you know, all that kind of stuff. Enough of my fashion commentary. I know you were very excited to know what I like to do in the fall, but I just thought I'd share that because I know you woke up this morning thinking, I wonder what Pastor Mark likes to wear in the fall. Anyway, now that we've covered that, let's get on to other things. Um, I want to talk, you know, just like, well, I will say this, just like I got up this morning to put this jacket on so that when I go out, I'm already prepared for the weather. I'm already prepared for the, the, the atmosphere, right? And, and that's really what I'm preaching on today is, is you've got to put on some things in order to be ready for the atmosphere that you live in. And uh, so if I went out and got out in the middle of cool weather, knowing the weather was going to be cool and went out in my short sleeve shirt. And then suddenly thought, oh, I better go back home and get a jacket. Well, you know, if I already knew what the weather was going to be like, that doesn't make any sense. I need to prepare. So I've already got my jacket on, right? We'll talk more about that in a minute. Let me pray with you, and then we're going to get started. Father, thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for your love and mercy. Thank you for your faithfulness. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have won the victory. You have defeated the forces of darkness. You have defeated the principalities and powers and the authorities and the heavenly realms. You have, you have defeated sin and death. And you have brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And it's through your gospel, Lord, that we find hope and we find freedom and we find peace. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your word that fills us, feeds us, transforms us, sanctifies us. Lord, makes us holy. Now, Lord, help us as we get into your word today. Let your word get into us today. Um, fill our mind, our heart, our spirit, Lord, with your truth today. And lead us into, into the battle that we face today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> While you're getting your Bible, I hope, and going to Ephesians chapter 6, let me just say something. You know, like I said about my jacket, when you, when you, put your, when you know the weather forecast, and, you know, they've been telling us for days that when, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, we're going to hit some cooler temperatures. It's going to be great. But be ready. You know, dress for it. Have what you need, right? Well, it, like I said, that's what I have to do because I know what's coming. Well, you know, the Bible tells us that there's, there are things coming. The Bible tells us that we're in a conflict against principalities and powers and, and forces of darkness. And we've got to dress for that. We can't go out into the world surprised, oh my goodness, uh, the, there, there must really be a devil out there. There must really be problems out there that uh, we've got to understand the, the atmosphere we're living in. And I would say that I would spell atmosphere today, A-T-M-O-S-F-E-A-R, atmosphere, because a lot of people are living in an atmosphere of fear. And, and so that's what the enemy tries to do. He tries to get us afraid. He tries to shake us from our faith. He tries to get us worried and, and over, overwhelmed with anxiety and concern. And, and then, then, then when you get afraid, what do you do? You, you kind of close off to yourself. You pull away from one another. You pull away from each other. You pull away from God. You kind of isolate, right? And that's what the enemy wants to do. So don't let him do that, church. Don't let him play that game with you. Right. The issue isn't, uh, you know, your opinions about vaccinations. The issue is your attitude towards your brothers and sisters. Let me say that again. The issue you're facing today is not your opinion about vaccinations and face masks. The issue you're facing today is regardless of your opinion, how are you going to relate to your brothers and sisters in Christ? How are you, as a member of the body of Christ, going to respond to the people around you? How are you going to live? Are you going to spend your life reacting or responding? You know, fear is a reaction. Faith is a response. Let me say that again. Fear is a reaction. Faith is a response. So you get to spend your life making this decision. I'm going to either 
be a reactionary person, which is what people in power really want right now, and all, all sorts of levels of society, and and uh, or am I going to be a person who responds in faith? I look at the atmosphere, I look at what's going on around me, and I think, okay, how does faith call me to live? How is God moving me to live in reality, in, in the reality in which we live? And so Paul gives us some really great counsel here in Ephesians chapter 6. And my message today is called, Don't Just Stand There, Stand Therefore. Stand Therefore. And that's a play on words that, that therefore is, if Paul writes, he begins in verse 14, there, stand therefore. You know, you can either just stand there and watch what's happening, in the world and just act like it's not happening or you can act like it's too much and you can't respond to it or you can stand there for in other words you can stand there for God's purpose you can stand there for God's power you can stand there for God's call on your life you can stand there for one another you see my point I, it is I'm a dad I like to play on words I like to do that but think about it stand therefore now I know that when he says that word therefore that that therefore is therefore something else, isn't it? That therefore means that what he just got through saying has a bearing on what he's about to say, right? That's what that's about. And so I want you to look with me. Let me start at verse 10 and just read that, and then we're going to pick up teaching on verse 14 through 17 today. Don't just stand there. Stand therefore. Don't just stand around watching what's happening in the world. Stand there for something. Stand there for Christ. Stand there for one another. Stand there for your faith. But let's look at verse 10. It says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. He's saying, look, put on the purpose, the power, and presence of God so you can stand against the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Um, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. I'm interested in, you know, when you talk like this, and you, there's a lot of talk about battle and armor and, and that kind of thing, you would think Paul would say some things like fight. Fight, 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 struggle. But he keeps saying this one word. He keeps saying stand. Isn't that interesting? That the number one thing we see Paul saying in the context here is stand. He says put on the armor of God and stand. Put on the full armor of God so you can stand. And then in verse 14 we're about to look at today, he says stand therefore, right? And then he goes into the armor of God. And so, <clears throat> I'm not going to do a lecture on the Roman armor. I'm, you've probably heard that. And it's true, and it's good, but I'm going to go kind of a different direction today. We are going to look at, at the different aspects of the, of the whole armor of God. But I want us to see it in a different way. If you'll notice, when you read... Uh, well, let me just read verses 14 and 15. It says, Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Now, there's two more verses coming after this, but the first two verses, I've noticed something, that every one of those verses talk about past tense. They say, having past tense, having fastened the belt of truth, having put on already in the past the breastplate of righteousness and then third having put on the shoes of the gospel of peace notice the first two verses are what you've already done he says having done this in verses 16 and 17 he talks present tense now take up right so we go from having done this in verses 14 and 15 to now do this in verses 16 and 17. And I think that's significant. I don't believe that's accidental. I believe that what Paul is saying, that there are some things that before the battle you ought to have already done. There are some things that if you're going to face a battle, if you're going to be able to stand in victory, stand therefore having done these things, there are some basic things that you need to already have done before the battle comes. Because if you haven't done those things before the battle comes, 
then you're, you're going to have a really tough time. doesn't mean you can't do them, but you're going to have a real tough time. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people who are saying they're Christian who haven't done these three basic things. Now, so I want to look at verses 14. What should you do before the battle? In other words, when it, some of you may not be in a battle right now. You might be like, everything's okay. We're kind of chilling. You know, life's good. I'm just kind of moving along and, and doing my thing, and I'm all right. And, and a lot of Christians live, have lived this way in the past, and now we're entering into times where, where there's some things you're going to look back and realize, man, I, I'm not even ready for what's happening in this world today. I think a lot of Christians have been caught off guard because they've spent so much of their life not really caring much about the things of God. They, well, I got saved, and I got baptized, and then they just kind of dropped it. It's just like they just left it. And just kind of went on about their business and did their life and doing life and kind of living their own stuff and not really taking hold of what it means to be a Christian. There's three essential things that as you look in verses 14 and 15 that you need to already have done before the battle comes. And you need to ask yourself today, have I done these things? Have I done these things? Because they're essential things. The first thing he says is having fastened on the belt of truth. He's not saying, now, I used to hear this preach and say, now, every morning you get up and fasten the belt of truth. That's not what it says. You already ought to have done this, having fastened on the belt of truth. Now, what is that? What, what's that about? Well, Jesus made some statements about truth that I think we need to pay attention to. First one, he said, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. The first thing I've got to do is come to Jesus straight up. I, have I fastened on Jesus? Have I re repented of my sin and put my faith in Jesus Christ? That's how you fasten on the belt of truth, is that you get in touch with the truth that Jesus Christ, is he your Lord and Savior? Is he really your Lord and Savior? Now, there's a lot of people say, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, but he's not Lord or Savior. They're not obeying him. They're not following him. They don't trust him. But they, one time at a revival, they said, they repeated the prayer that an evangelist told them to repeat. And then they said, well, I'm good. I'm going to heaven now because I said the magic words. Guys, that's not faith. That's superstition. I'm not saved by superstition. I'm not saved by reciting poetry. I'm saved. Now, if you said the sinner's prayer from a repentant heart and you were truly turning to Christ, that's different. But a lot of people just said it like a mantra. I said, Lord Jesus Christ, my personal Savior, amen. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> no, you know what? If there has been no repentance, if there is no faith, there is no salvation. So the first thing I've got to do is I've got to ask myself, have I fastened on the belt of truth? Has Jesus Christ become truly my Savior and my Lord? Am I trusting him for my salvation? Have I repented? Am I still repenting of my sin? Am I following him? Now, Jesus said something else about truth. He said, look, if you continue in my word, you're truly my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, this is an ongoing thing, that once I've received the truth in Jesus, right, then I need to be walking in the truth, and, and, and not my own truth. This is not where you get to get saved and then live your own truth. Tapping into all the other types of truth out there. No, I need to walk in him. He says, look, it says, if you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Right? But he was referring to himself. He said, look, get in my word. Are you walking in the word of God? This ought to already be part of your life. F fastening the belt of truth has two aspects to it. First, it's the conversion, the true repentance and faith. I've turned from my sins. I've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting what he did on the cross for me and his resurrection. And I've made him Lord and King of my life. And now I, and I daily am now walking in truth, walking according to his word. You say, well, where do we get Jesus' truth? Well, Jesus said it. He said in his prayer for his disciples, he said, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So I, I, how do I, sanctify means to make holy. So am I being made holy in the truth? In other words, guys, is the word of God part of your life? Are you, are you, are you doing more than just reading your daily devotion? Are you seeking to know God? Are you seeking to obey his word? That's what it means to continue in my word. There's a lot of people who got saved, but then they, they got saved from God instead of getting saved for God, 
right? As I, I want to get saved so I don't have to deal with God anymore. That's not salvation. That's escapism. Salvation is I turn to God. I need Him. I realize that I'm lost without Him. And I, I cling to Him. He's my Lord and my Savior, my King. And a good friend that, that's, that's recently become a believer, my friend Stacy, who says every day, says, I, I'm in the Word every day, and I just love Jesus, and I want Him to know me. Stacy, kudos to you. Shout out to you. You keep going. You keep going after God. But listen, see, she loves the Word, and she loves the God of the Word, and she's growing in Him. And see, that's what that's about. That's what that means. And so are, have you put on the belt? First and foremost, are you saved, and are you walking in it? That's the first thing. Now, the second thing it says in the same verse is having done something else. It says having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, righteousness has two meanings. One meaning is are you doing the right stuff? Being the righteous person. In other words, obeying the commands of God, living righteously. But there's a bigger thing, and that is that Christ is my righteousness. I can't live in self righteousness. I can't talk about, let me show you how good I can be for God. How do you put on the breastplate of righteousness? That means you receive Christ's righteousness. The Bible says that we are made righteous or justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Are you relying on Jesus Christ for your righteousness? Is he your source of Are you, if you're, when, when the evangelist asks you, if they ask you why I should let you in heaven, what would you say? If you say anything less than Jesus Christ is my righteousness, then you're, you're missing it. If, you're, if you think you're going to stand before God and tell him all the good things you've done so you can go to heaven, you're missing it. You're missing it because that, that won't save you. Your good deeds won't save you. Your kindness, your social action won't save you. What saves you is faith in Jesus Christ. And true faith leads to obedience. So understand that. Now, the third thing is having put on the shoes of the gospel of peace, or the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In other words, have I adopted the gospel as my lifestyle? Now, there's two levels here. Number one, why did he say shoes? Because what do you do with shoes? You walk around in them. Am I walking in the gospel? In other words, am I walking in the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is it, is it my walk? Am I walking in a manner worthy of the calling with which I've been called? Am I walking the walk, walking in the light of the gospel? In other words, am I walking in light of what Jesus has done for me on the cross? There are people who say they're saved, but they're walking in sin. Are you walking in the light? In other words, I know none of us are perfect. I know none of us get everything right, and we make mistakes, and we fall. I get that. I'm not saying, are you perfect without mistakes? I'm saying, are you purposefully, listen to this, purposefully and meaningfully walking in step with the Spirit as best you can? Are you purposefully and meaningfully walking in obedience and faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ as best you can. You know, we're all learning, aren't we? We're all growing in that. None of us are getting everything right. But we're walking by faith, not by sight. Are you doing that? That's my, But the other level is, am I walking with the gospel that I might share it with somebody else? You know, your gospel is not your secret lifestyle. Your gospel is your mission. It's your message. It's let, Jesus said you don't put a lamp under a bed and turn it on and hope you, so, so the bugs under the bed can have light. You put it up in the middle of the room so the whole house is lit. Are you letting your light shine before men and women so they can see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven? Are you letting your light shine? I'm not saying are you beating people up with your Bible. I'm not saying are you are you a weird fanatic who's chasing people away from Jesus. I'm talking, are you living it in such a way that people know what you're about? They know who you care about. They know you love God. They know he's priority in your life. And are you speaking reasonably and, and lovingly to people about your faith? You don't have to freak out on people and, and wig out and act like some kind of weird person. Just be a normal human being who loves Jesus and tell them why. Tell them why you rely on him. Tell them about times that they've that God has helped you in your life. Tell them about the peace you have from knowing your sins are forgiven. You can do that in a normal way. You don't have to freak out on people. And so just to so here's the deal. Verses 14 and 15. Before the battle, I should have already done three things. I should have adopted the truth of Jesus. I should have fastened him around my life. 
Number two, I should have accepted his righteousness as my righteousness. That I'm righteous before God, not because of anything I've done, but because of what God did for me on the cross. That, that he, he became sin who knew no sin so that I might become the righteousness of God in him. I am the righteousness of God in him. You see, it's Jesus, not me. It's nothing I've done. It's Jesus. He is the only righteousness I have. And, and, so, and then third is the gospel becoming my way of life. Am I learning to walk in it? Am I learning to walk in it? And so I should have already, been, having done these things, let's see in verses 14 and 15, it's past tense. Having fastened, having put on, having put on. You see the point? Then, that's what you do before the battle. The reason a lot of people enter into battles unprepared is they haven't done the simple thing of securing their relationship with Jesus Christ. Because that's really what that's talking about. And, and so I, first and foremost, when you're in a battle, ask yourself, am I at peace with God? Am I at peace with God? Not am I at peace with myself. Am I at peace with God? Have I repented of my sins and am I walking as best I can in obedient faith in Jesus Christ? Now, guys, be honest with yourself. You know the truth. You know where you are with God. You know. Now, then in verses 16 and 17, he shifts over, if you'll notice, to present tense. And now it's take up. He says take up. Um, two times he says this, pick it up, right? This is what you do in the battle. We talked about what you do before the battle. And now we're talking about what you do in the battle, right? It would be a sad thing when I was in high school playing football. If I'd got out on the field on game night in my Sunday clothes or my school clothes, and then when they did the kickoff, said, wait a minute, I've got to run to the locker room and put my, put my equipment on, I'd have got creamed. I mean, and, and then the coach would have just killed me, right? You get the point. Get dressed before the battle, before game night. Don't wait until you're on the field. But when you're on the field, when you're in the battle, here's what we do. Verses 16 and 17. Let me read them to you. In all circumstances. Now, there, that's key. All circumstances. You know, your faith it was designed to carry you through all circumstances. There is nothing you should separate or compartmentalize and take away from your relationship with God. There are no parts of your life that are not influenced by the gospel. God wants you to be dressed everywhere you go. You don't get to have a part-time discipleship. You can't be a part-time soldier when the battle is raging. And so you've got to say, look, all circumstances. Let me just ask you this question before we move on. Is there anything in your life right now that's raging with battle that you have not allowed the Lord to come in and fight for you. Is there some area that you've decided, well, God doesn't care about that. Oh, God can't touch that. Oh, I don't want to talk to God about that. Friend, that's where the heat of the battle is. That's the, that's the place where you really need to bring him in. That place you're not comfortable letting him have control. That's, no, that's priority one. You've got, what is it? What is it? And, and be honest with yourself and say, God, what circumstances am I not allowing you? Listen, you'll see things change. When you stop saying, well, God only handles the religious things in my life. If that's true, then you don't have a faith, you have a fantasy. Uh, the, the real faith permeates all of life. Now, then he goes on, what does he say first? In all circumstances, take up what? The shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Now, this is super important. The devil loves to throw lies at people. He will throw flaming lies at you. He will tell you that, that you don't need God or that you're not worthy of God. He'll tell you that you're not adequate. And he'll tell you that there's no hope. He'll tell you that things can't change. He'll tell you you can never change, that, that this miracle's never going to happen. He'll tell you that you're done, you're finished. And he will, and it's usually at your weakest moment and your worst moment. That's when the devil loves to come after you. And the only thing you can do is lift up the shield of faith. Now, now what does that mean practically, though? I mean, people say, okay, yeah, yeah, that sounds wonderful, wonderful metaphor. But what does it mean? Listen, it means that I make the decision 
to believe what God says more than I believe what's happening around me. If it looks like my financial ruin is on the horizon and that the bills are piling up and the money is just not there, I lift the shield of faith and say, but I'm going to trust that God says, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And even though right now the reality that I'm seeing looks like I'm done, the reality that God says is if I tap into that and choose to believe his word more, and it's hard sometimes, and let's just admit it, then I'm lifting up the shield of faith and saying, Satan, I, I, I don't believe anything you've got to say. I know it looks impossible right now. I know it looks like I'm finished right now. But I'm going to tell you what. God says he's on my side. And God says I overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved me. God says he'll never leave me or forsake me. Some of you are very lonely right now. And you feel like nobody's on your side. You feel like, and it looks like, nobody cares for you. Because you've got all these difficulties and problems. And nobody calls you on the phone. And nobody checks on you and sees how you're doing and you're feeling all by yourself and but you know what the, the bible says that god says i'm with you always even to the end of the age now you got to believe that and accept that as reality don't just kind of religiously nod your head at it but you've got to really get before god sit with god and say god i'm choosing to believe that you're with me right now i don't feel it i'm not feeling it but i'm believing it say it with me i'm not feeling it but I'm believing it. And that's really what lifting the shield of faith means. It means that, and also faith means obedience. You see, having faith is more than agreeing with facts. It's now saying, okay, now that I believe this truth, how am I going to change the way I conduct myself in light of it? You see, if I, if I believe the fears that the devil throws, that everything's falling apart and all the world's falling apart and we're going into chaos and nothing's going to work and, and all the bad people are going to take over and everything's going to be horrible and we're all going to die of COVID and, and all this kind of stuff and it's just terrible, horrible, no good, rotten. And, and But I believe God. God says, look, I've got a plan for you. I've got a purpose for you. I'm not going to forsake you. And God never abandons those who seek him. God is near to all who call on him in truth. See, I accept that as my reality. And I said, no, no, I'm not. Now, if I live by the world's reality, I'm going to run around like a chicken with my head cut off and in a state of panic all the time, which is what a lot of people are doing. But if I believe God, I'm going to walk in faith. I'm going to walk in confidence. I'm going to say, look, I know things are rough right now. I know that things are stormy right now. But I'm, I'm trusting in him. And, I, and I've got my hand on him. Then it goes on to say, take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. And it's related to the shield of faith. Take, in other words, the helmet protects your head. And my thought patterns, I need to believe in my mind and my heart that I'm his child. The helmet of salvation. That means that I believe I've cleared my mind of the lies of this world. And my mind is focused on what God has said over me. The world may say I'm a loser, but God says I'm his child. The world says I'm a failure, but God says I'm his anointed. God, The world says this mistake can never be reversed. That I've made a terrible mistake in my life, some of you have, and you feel like your life is over. And you feel like there's no hope. But the Bible says that God is my redeemer. That he can redeem my worst mistakes. He can redeem my regrets. He can redeem and restore the, the bad turns I've made, the missteps I've made. <clears throat> some of you are listening to me right now, and you've made some really bad mistakes. And, you, and you're living in some regret right now. Some of you are sick at home, and you're quarantined, and all you do is sit around with your thoughts. And you sit around with thinking about all the things you wish you had done differently. But I want you to know that the helmet of salvation protects my head because I remember that he's my redeemer that my Redeemer can save and change and heal and restore. And guys, there is nothing God won't do for His anointed. You are His holy child. If you're redeemed, that means that you have been covered. That means you have been bought back. That means you have been restored by the love and power of God. And if you've come to Jesus and you've trusted in Him, He's committed to you. And even in your worst moments, He's your Redeemer. And so cover my head. Lord, get my thoughts in line with your truth. Get my thoughts in line with your salvation, the helmet of salvation. And the last one, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I really love this because the sword of the Spirit shows me that I can fight. This is where I fight. 
I take the word of God to fight. But look, in the Greek text, I'm going I'm to show you how fancy I can be right now. There's two Greek words in the New Testament for, for word. There's logos, which means the written and spiritual written word of God. that Jesus, the living Logos, he's the word of God become flesh. And then there's the written word of God, the scripture, that, that we read to learn and grow. There's the Logos, the spoken word. But there's also the Rhema. Rhema has to do with a word of God that is spoken that makes things happen. When God spoke, said, let there be light, there was light. Uh, the rhema is an, a word that activates things. And guess which of the two is in Ephesians 6? The rhema word of God. The spoken word of God. This is powerful if you get hold of it. I need to learn to speak the word of God into my circumstances. Let me be specific. When you pray about your situation, don't just pray the problem. Pray the promise. When, I, when I'm facing uh, sickness, for example, when I pray for the healing of the sick, I almost always will say something like, by your stripes we are healed in Jesus' name, because that's the word of God. And I'm speaking that in. When I, when I pray against uh, demonic forces and, and lying spirits that are oppressing people, I use the word of God. That greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And that if we submit to God, if we resist the devil, he'll flee from us. You see, I'm speaking warfare. I'm speaking truth into the heavenly realms. And you see, the enemy responds to that. The re enemy reacts to that. The enemy can't handle. When you pray, talk about the blood of Jesus. Listen, the blood of Jesus breaks the bondage of all, of all things. And the blood of Jesus redeems us, sanctifies us, justifies us, sets us free. And so when I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for the blood that you shed on the cross that defeats the enemy. And so listen, but then, you know, you can also do it in conversation. And you don't have to sound weird to do this. In conversation, if somebody's talking about your problem, you say, yeah, but you know what? The Lord says he's going to provide for me. You know, the Lord says that I, I, I'll need all your needs according to his riches and glory. You know, just in conversation, you're casually speaking the word of God. You're speaking the truth of God into reality. And, it, and it's activating, and there is something happening supernatural when you speak his word. Most people speak despair when they ought to be speaking faith. Most people are talking more about the problem than about the problem solver. How many people do I see posting on Facebook, Oh, friends, the devil, he's got us now. He's the devil. Let me tell you, about, I, we got some Christians that are great evangelists for the devil. I mean, they're a great PR people for Satan because all they do is talk about what the devil's doing. Oh, the devil's got us. He's just doing terrible. He's awful. He's, let me tell you something. Let me talk to you what God's doing. God is setting people free. God is healing the sick, raising the dead. He's casting out demons. He's forgiven sin. He's breaking new ground for the gospel in the middle of all these crises. God's bringing about his kingdom on the earth. And you know what? He said the gates of hell will not prevail against the Lord's church. And that's the way it is. Don't you listen to anybody that tells you Christianity's on the way out. It's just, well, listen, we're just getting started. Christ's bride is radiant. And when he comes again, he's coming for a radiant bride. Every eye will see him. And every tongue will confess him. And every knee will bow before him. You see, I'm right even this moment, I'm speaking his truth into the atmosphere. The atmo, atmos fear, F-E-A-R, because we're in a world. But listen, he, Jesus, you know what Jesus says about fear? Not. That's what he says about fear. Fear not, for I am with you. Listen, you stand in faith and you speak the word of God. That's what you do in the heat of your battle. I want you to get hold of a promise of God, a truth of God. And every time you start thinking about your problem, I want you to pray that word into the atmosphere. And I want you, when you're in conversation, I want you to stop complaining about what the devil's doing in your life. And, and you can talk about the problem, that's okay, but I want you to give prime time to what God says about your problem. You can say, you know, I'm having a rough time right now. I'm, I'm really struggling, but you know what? God's my healer. He is my healer. He's my provider. He's my king. You know what? Be bold about it. Stop being ashamed to talk about God. Don't you let this culture shame you out of your witness. You speak his word boldly whether they like it or not. And I promise you they're not going to like it. But somebody's going to get healed. Somebody's going to get redeemed. Are you listening to me? You've got to get on with this because we're in a battle.
We're in a fight. You're in a fight. Your problem is not just a problem. Your problem is, is worse than you think it is because it's not just you having money problems. It's not just you having marriage problems. It's not just you having personal problems. It's the enemy trying to encroach into your life with the kingdom of darkness. And you have got to fight him. And you've got the victory in Jesus. The problem is that you haven't been using it. Now start speaking the truth. Start lifting up the shield of faith. Make sure you're buckled into truth. Make sure you're covered in his righteousness. Make sure that you put, your, put in your head the thoughts of salvation. You fill your mind with the word of God. And you speak it when you pray. You speak it in conversation. You speak Speak it all the time. Even in, by yourself, you tell the devil to get out. And you praise the Lord. And listen, you just take authority in your life. Take authority over the kingdom of darkness. You take your family back. You say, look here, devil. Get out of my house. Satan, you don't have any place here. Now, and then, but you spend the majority of your time talking to Jesus, all right? We need to rebuke the devil, but don't spend too much time on him. Spend more time talking out loud to Jesus. Jesus, thank you that you ruined my family. Thank you that you've got a destiny for my children. Thank you that you've got a destiny for my marriage. Thank you that you've got, you've got a calling on my life. And you're, you're never going to give up on me. Thank you, God, that you're my redeemer and my worst mistakes are under the blood of Jesus Christ. And I have a new life now and I can walk in hope and freedom and peace. And listen, you start saying it, you'll start believing it. You start praying it and you'll start living it. This is what he calls you to do. That's battle. That's how you win this thing. You don't win this thing by posting hateful posts against the atheist. You don't win this thing by talking about how you hate the liberals or the conservatives, whichever thing you're mad at. And don't, you, don't, you don't get there. You get it by declaring the word. Put on your online thing. Fill that thing with the word of God and refuse to pass on negative, uh, evil, gossip, slanderous stuff on you. Don't even allow it on your page. You speak the truth of God. You tell the truth and you tell it like it is and you speak it boldly. And, and listen, that's what we need. We need a church that will be victorious in an age of fear. A church that will walk in faith and confidence, courage and strength. And yes, if you've got to speak against something, speak, but do it in faith and in love. Let your faith and love be bold. Let it be strong. You might have to confront darkness. Do it. Go for it. Don't, don't, don't apologize. But do it in love and strength and power with the expectation that God is going to bring about His, His will and purpose. Stop condemning the world. Stop condemning the church. Stop condemning your life and start speaking truth. Watch what God does. Listen, there's so much more I want to say, but, but I just want to tell you this. Don't just stand there. Stand there for. Stand there for the gospel. Stand there for the kingdom. Stand there for uh, those people who need to know what you already have. Listen, and if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, listen, he's the refuge in this storm. He's the only hope you've got. You've got to turn from your sins and trust in him. You can do that right where you are. You can say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I'm sorry for my sin. I want to change. Lord, come save me, cleanse me, make me new. Lord, I surrender everything I am to you. Guys, it's that simple. And, uh, and then, then connect with the church. Connect with the body of Christ and stand together with them. You can't do this on your own. So let's, let's stand together in him. Let's link our shields together. And so then we'll march forward in Christ. Let's, let's stop dividing over fearful things. Let's stop letting the world lead us and start letting the Spirit lead us. Then no matter what they're saying on the screen, you go after Him. Even no matter what you're hearing right now from me, you get your Bible open, you crack that thing open, and you find out what God has to say for you. And you listen to it, and you walk by faith and not by sight. Thank you for listening. God bless you. Go in peace.